Hello and welcome. All right, I'm hearing some audio. So for anyone new to the stream, each week, oh, okay, got the thumbs up, good. For anyone new, each week we pick a new national park to explore together. This week we're exploring Guadalupe Mountains National Park, as you can see from this beautiful image uh, just beneath me. We'll also vote near the end on the next national park we want to explore together, so look out for that and other posts and polls in the chat as we fly around. Also, feel free to add your own comments or, or thoughts as we go. I love chatting with all of you, so uh, so feel free to just post what's on your mind. Uh, small disclaimer, yes, I am a pilot, but we'll be taking full advantage of this being a simulator. So please don't try this in real life. We've also researched the park and a couple of related topics in preparation and helped improve their Wikipedia pages. We use Wikipedia to make sure the facts are checked by others and are cited, and as a way to give back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour here together. To that end, if you notice anything that's missing or could be better clarified, um, feel free to go and update the wiki pages. As the wiki community often says, be bold and make the changes. Without further ado, I'm Jules Altus and I'll be your pilot for this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore Guadalupe Mountains National Park. All right, whoa, hello there. I think I saw Xbox Master floating around here somewhere. Hello, Xbox Master. Thank you very much, Fractals. So as I do my little takeoff roll here, I'm in a, a fun little um, aerobatic plane. So it's a little harder to control, but it's a very fun one to fly. Let me get myself off the ground here. So Fractals posted up the poll. Have you ever been to this national park, to Guadalupe Mountain? So yes in the last 10 years, yes once upon a time, or not yet. As for me, I'm in that not yet category. It was on my list. Uh, my wife and I actually did a road trip, uh, man, seven months ago or so, and we had an opportunity to go there. But um, interestingly enough, we got snowed out in the in Guadalupe Mountains. We were avoiding a snowstorm, so we decided to, to skip that part of it. So like I mentioned, I'm flying a, uh, a Cap-10. It looks like this. And you can tell it's an aerobatic plane because it has that little weird triangle on the wing. That's so you know where the horizon is. Nice thing. Let me see if I can see around. There we are. Hey, a flying singer. Got the Cap-10 too. Yep. It's a fun little plane. A uh, small administrative update. It's National Park Week this week. And so there are many events across the different national parks, and they also released a new National Park uh, Service app. So if you're looking for another app to explore, uh, that's kind of a, that's pretty fun. I was poking around it earlier. I would say similar information to what's on the websites, which makes sense, uh, but a lot of fun to, to see it all put together like that. And they have a little like, do your own logbook sort of thing. Uh, if you're a fellow pilot, you may enjoy that logbook aspect. So a little bit of background on the, oops, I should check out the fractals. Good memory. We did fly the Cap-10 back in St. Louis Arch. Yep. It's a, it's an aerobatic plane, but it's a trainer. And so it's a little more stable as far as they go. Uh, we did, when we went to Petrified Florist, we, uh, Forest, we flew that uh, Pit Special, which was a uh, biplane. And that one's very uh, flimsy in the air. Ooh, sounds awesome, Chance. Uh, Xbox Master, I assume, then? And uh, let us know how it is. I know uh, Niall Enns used to do a lot of the, the VR flying. He said it was a pretty pretty good way to do it. It's a lot of canyons for this, so... Oh, x Tonight Flying Singer. Got it. Very fun. Uh, uh, chances you're flying around, then I would recommend getting in the canyons and, and kind of checking them out. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool flight, actually, for, for that kind of thing. Lots of texture. Speaking of the Guadalupe Mountains, so the National Park is meant to preserve, protect, and interpret an area of outstanding geological values, scenery. This is the park purpose, purpose, park purpose statement. Um, I interrupted myself because it's worth noting that it's a little bit generic as far as these go. Usually they're super specific to the park. Um, we'll talk about some of the reasons why the park is special in more detail, but park purpose statement. Guadalupe Mountains National Park pre preserves, protects, and interprets an area of outstanding geological values, scenery, wilderness, and other natural resources in the northern Chihuahuan Desert of West Texas. This is near Big Bend, for those of you who were along for the flight in Big Bend. I'll try and poke my head out the window a little bit more on this flight, because you'll see it's a very uh, textured landscape. And we'll actually be flying, I have the 
This is called the VFR sectional map. Uh, I don't usually show it here because it's a little bit noisy, a little bit busy um, for just a, a casual flight um, on the iPad. But you'll see that we're flying over Carlsbad Caverns National Park in just a minute here. So Carlsbad is just a couple of miles to the north of Guadalupe Mountains. Like I mentioned, it's a uh, park in the, the west side of, of Texas, so it's just east of El Paso, Texas. The mountain range includes Guadalupe Peak, which is the highest point in Texas at 8,750 feet, and El Capitan, which is was used as a landmark by travelers on the route later followed by the Butterfield Overland Mail Stagecoach Line. So you're crossing the desert of Texas on the Stagecoach Line, and you're able to navigate by El Capitan. Uh, when we get a little closer, you'll see why they use it. It's very pronounced in the landscape. It is also the same name as El Capitan from Yosemite, so if you're uh, realizing that they're a very similar name that is that is correct and true. Um, they also have a kind of similar bold feel to them, so you'll see it when we get a little bit closer. I'll show a picture. Okay. The other piece of the park that's worth knowing about is the gypsum sand dunes, which lie on the west start west side of the park. So we'll fly over those a little bit. They're smaller than the White Sands National Park sand dunes, but it's a similar sort of sort of sand that's, that occurs there. The park itself covers 86,000 uh, plus acres in the same mountain range as the Carlsbad Caverns National Park. So this is a continuation of that same mountain range. It's also a karst land form. So for those of you who were here when we went to Mammoth Cave, you'll remember karst formations. So you'll notice some of that same kind of textured landscape. I can kind of flip a wing here. So you'll notice off in the distance, it's sort of carved in a little bit like um, like the area around Mammoth Cave was. So same sort of sort of thing, limestone, limestone cave system. I do have two videos about the park today. They're both a little short, um, but they're highly related to the topics. So I'm going to play them instead as we get to each of the topics. So I'll play the first video and the first topic, second video and second topic, and you'll learn a little bit about the park at each one which means that we get to dive right into our person of the week this week. So person of the week is Wallace Pratt. Now Wallace Pratt looks like this. It's a good look, honestly. I think I could, I could rock that hat, I think. So Wallace Pratt, uh, why, why this person for the park? So in 1921, Wallace Pratt, was a, uh, who was a geologist for Humble Oil and Refining Company, was impressed by the beauty of uh, McKittrick, McKittrick Canyon, which will be the first canyon we fly over, and bought land to build two houses there. Both were used as summer homes by Pratt and his family until 1960. Wallace Pratt donated about 6,000 acres of the McK McKittrick Canyon, which later became the Guadalupe Mountains National Park, and was dedicated and formally opened to the public, which was dedicated and formally opened to the public, uh, September of 1972. So that house, one of the houses that he donated looks like this. You can still see it in the park if you go and visit, when you go and visit. Kind of a, a cute little house. And you'll see the area is, is really incredible. Uh, actually, I have a picture of it. I can, I'll pull it up real quick so you can get a sense. So I may show this later too. But that's McKittrick Canyon. And looking from a distance, it looks kind of like that. So, very cool place to go. So, a little bit about Wallace Pratt. Wallace Pratt was a pioneer, uh, lived from 1885 until 1981, and he was a pioneer American petroleum geologist. Uh, pioneer American petroleum geologist. Excuse me. He was notable as the landowner of the McKittrick Canyon land parcel to the Guadalupe Mountains National Park. That piece that I just mentioned. Let me quickly trim up my plane before I, uh, this is the same thing you do in a real airplane. I have a sort of speed target that I'm going for. Okay. That should work. You can get a view of the landscape too. Flying Singer is just booking it down there. Okay. So as I was saying, Wallace Pratt was a pioneer petroleum geologist. He joined Humble Oil and Refining Co. in 1918 as the company's first geologist. Prior to that time, the company had treated the search for oil as largely a hit or miss. Um, you may remember when we went to Gates of the Arctic National Park, we talked a lot about how important geologists became to the oil industry when they realized that they could provide a insight on where oil probably is located. So he was one of those, one of those geologists. 
uh, Pratt, joined by 10 other geologists in 1918 to 1919, proved that geology was an important factor in finding oil. Among the notable contrib contributions, early, early contributions made by Pratt and his staff were geological studies that led to the correct interpretation of the structure of a huge oil field in East Texas. Pratt also played a prominent role in the scientific progress of his profession. After studying others' results, Pratt concluded that the humble oil should establish a shop in Houston for geophysics research and development and manufacture a refraction seismograph recording in the field. That tool, the seismograph, uh, the refraction seismograph, excuse me, would be a way then of, of finding oil, something more scientifically based. Pratt served as Humboldt's chief geologist and later director, and then later vice president. In 1937, he joined Standard Oil Co., which was Humboldt's, uh, Humble Oil Co.'s uh, parent firm in New Jersey, and once again rose to director, then executive committee member, and finally vice president, a position he held until his retirement in 1945 a little bit about Wallace Pratt, the person of the day. Now we're going to fly a lot of this stuff that we're over right now. This is Carlsbad Canyon, so I can do actually part of the reason I picked this plane. We can do some of this sort of stuff. So when we go to Carlsbad, we'll fly, we'll take a slightly different route so we get a different view. Um, but the you can see that, that kind of karst formation. It's supposed to be a very pretty park to go hike around as well. Um, Guadalupe Mountains too, both of them. But we are right over the, the center of Carlsbad uh, National Park. I'm only half following the chat. That's fine. Uh, okay. That then takes us into our first topic for today. So while we fly over beautiful Carlsbad, uh, Fractals, do you mind posting up the poll? While Fractals gets that up, I will get our first video set up. So like I mentioned, we have two. So our first topic today is uh, reefs. We'll talk a little bit and specifically about coral reefs, but the topic generally is just reefs. So people vote on that and uh, let me do this. This is where my autopilot comes in handy. I think, I think I can do that. Let me get my headphones. It has been said that the national parks of the United States are often established to preserve an outstanding geologic feature. Perhaps the biggest reason the Guadalupe Mountains of extreme western Texas was established as a national park was to preserve the best Permian fossil reef in the world. Okay, so quick pause on that one. So the reason it was created may be to preserve this coral reef, this ancient coral reef. Also, we're only going to watch about two minutes of this video. Yeah, so, okay. The fossils of the Guadalupe Mountains reveal what life along the coastline of a shallow inland sea some 240 to 280 million years ago was like. The reef was built by an accumulation of invertebrate skeletons such as algae and sponges. These skeletons were cemented together by another organism that helped form the solid rock. The blue area on this map shows where the sea existed and the colored outline on this map shows where the limestone reefs formed along that ancient coastline. By the end of the Permian Age, the reef and it I'm going to quickly pull up that reef system. This whole video is very, very low quality, um, which is unfortunate, but um, let me see. My link is not working. Well, that's why, okay. All right, so this is that reef system, so you can see where it is relative to the rest of the, the land. So here we have El Paso, the edge of Texas here, and then the Guadalupe Mountains, Carlsbad, right where we're flying is where that reef was. Okay, I'll flip it. The adjacent sea were covered by thousands of feet of newer sediments that concealed everything for millions of years. 
Eventually, uplifting of the Earth's crust and erosion of the newer, softer sediments has exposed the great Captain Reef to the world once again. Even the famous Carlsbad Caverns of New Mexico exist in this same reef formation. The results of ongoing erosion today are easily seen in the Guadalupe Mountain National Park. These forces of erosion have created canyons that support a diverse community of plants. This collection of canyon plants is unique to this small portion of the world. Some of these plants are only found in the canyons of West Texas and Southern New Mexico. Now let's stand back and view what these canyons look like for a person hiking along the park's canyon trails. So now that we know what the canyons look like, let's look closer and see what a wonderful assortment of plants grow down in these stream beds of what we call a sky island or mountain environment. The chink. Okay, so the rest of the video is about the plants in the park. So it looks like, folks, what most of the votes are comes from coral polyps, symbiotic relationship with certain microscopic algae, or just a pigment or they're just born that way. It looks like most people got the correct answer on this one, which is that it comes from the coral polyps and they have a symbiotic relationship with microscopic algae. So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, that relationship. Oh, okay, I saw a big post it's from Streamlabs, that's right. So Connection to the park, we talked about a little bit in the video, but just to, to kind of emphasize some of those points. Guadalupe Mountains are part of a mostly buried 400 mile long U-shaped fossil reef complex called the Capitan Reef, which extends through a large area of West Texas and Southeastern New Mexico. It's a 400 mile long U-shaped fossil reef complex. The largest exposed section of the Capitan Reef, 20 uh, also it might be Captain Reef, I heard a lot of the National Park Service call it Captain Reef, um, but anyway, I spelled Capitan, so. Um, 12 miles of which is in the park extends from, sorry, the, the largest exposed section of this reef, which is uh, 12 of which is in the park, extends from the Guadalupe Mountains National Park, northeast, almost to the city of Carlsbad, New Mexico, a distance of 40 miles. This 260 to 270 million year old reef is one of the world's finest examples of an ancient reef system. So I showed that, that image of the edges of the reef system so you can see that it kind of overlaps a lot with where we're flying. If we look at this, is a picture of El Capitan, that rock face that we're gonna pass. That entire structure you're seeing is the fossilized coral reef. So we'll do a, a flight towards the, the middle of the flight where we kind of go around the mountains. Uh, and keep that in mind that it's just a, it's a giant reef. It's an exposed reef. Uh, and if you look in there, you can actually see while you're hiking. Uh, they, they say while you're hiking past Pratt's cabin, the one that we just talked about, you can look in the walls of the canyons and you'll see fossils just popping out at you um, from the different fish. Different parts of the park showcase different parts of the reef. Um, so if you know what you're looking for, you can kind of tell the depth of the wreath and that reef, reef and that sort of thing. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, but when you go to the park, that's something to look for as well. All right, we are coming up on the entrance to the park. I'll pop out real quick so we can do this sort of view from above. Now we're gonna enter on the, what's called the Dogwood Canyon entrance and then we'll fly up along and on our way back we'll fly through what you're seeing over here which is the McKittrick Canyon. So although this is a, a fossilized reef, a prehistoric reef, today we're going to talk about uh, modern reefs. So we'll, we'll stay a little bit more a little bit more modern today. So first what is a reef? A reef is a ridge or, or shoal of rock 
coral or similarly relatively stable material lying beneath the surface of a natural body of water. So the criteria for a reef is actually pretty open. Now, this is a topic with a lot of categories and a lot of subcategories of those categories. Don't worry about trying to remember it all, because um, the really important things to focus on are what they all have in common, and then the impacts that it would have to the environments that they're in. And you'll see those kinds of threads drawn throughout. So I'll talk about a lot of categories and subcategories, but it's all about the impact to the, to the ocean when the reefs exist. So first, what types exist? There are three main types of reefs. There's biotic, abiotic, and artificial. So a biotic reef would be formed by natural processes or living processes like coral reef, for instance. I'll pull up a picture of that. You may be familiar with these. Or, uh, so th that would be a biotic. An abiotic would be formed by non-living uh, but natural processes still. For instance, maybe the deposition of sand. So that would be like this sort of reef system. And the third one, artificial, is made by humans. So for instance, you could use blocks of cement, and that would create, be able to create sort of an artificial reef for maybe homes for fish or to start a colony there. You can also use, for instance, tires if you wanted to, um, which was someone's brilliant idea. Uh, it was not an accident to pour a ton of tires in. They were trying to make a reef. Uh, it did not work out, and it actually has a lot of environmental problems now. But, um, but that was the idea, at least, and technically doable. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about biotic reefs, uh, since that's the kind that we are dealing with in this park. There's three really common ones that you might come across. So the first would be an oyster reef. So the preferred substrate for oyster larvae is the shells of other oysters. And so they tend to settle on adult oysters and develop layers building upwards and eventually forming a fairly massive, hard, stony calcium carbonate structure where other reef organisms like sponges and seaweed can kind of grow. And it becomes a habitat for fish or other mobile organisms as well. This is oyster, oyster reef. Next one you might encounter would be a sponge reef. These are pretty uncommon now. The only one, the only place you can find it is the Western Canadian continental shelf. Uh, historically though, they were much more common. So these reefs are formed by certain sponges, which have a skeleton made of silica and are often referred to as glass sponges. Like I said, they're pretty rare and they're considered living fossils now because they've been around and haven't changed a ton. Pop back in the plane here as we cross over the mountains. The last one would be a coral reef. So a coral reef is an underwater ecosystem characterized by the uh, by reef building corals. Reefs are formed from colonies of coral polyps held together by calcium carbonate. Most coral reefs are built from stony corals whose polyps cluster in groups. So this would be an example of a coral reef. The so that, that's examples of biotic types of, of reefs. The actual way that the reefs form will have a different sort of impact on the, uh, the name, or at least the kind of development pattern that it goes through. So common uh, biotic reef types, coral reef types you might encounter are fringing reefs, barrier reefs, and atolls. And then we'll talk a little bit about platform reefs too on the side. So fringing reefs, <laughs> okay, the Wikipedia articles for these are sort of great and sort of sort of funny someone took like a microsoft paint and just sort of drew what it looks like but it's really helpful to explain so i'm going to show them but they're really really quickly drawn so you'll you'll see what i mean but anyway at least it'll kind of explain it so a fringing reef looks like this okay so you have your your slope of land and then the ocean and then the fringing reef on the side an actual fringing reef would look something like this this is a real life one The second kind of reef would be a barrier reef. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the fringing reef is a reef that is attached to the island, so kind of attached to the shelf like that. A barrier reef, which here's a terrible picture, looks like that, and it forms a barrier around an island, resulting in a lagoon between the shore and the reef. So an actual picture of what these looks like would be like this, a barrier reef, the Great Barrier Reef being an example. There's another example that we just saw, though, in Florida which is the uh, Florida Keys Reef. And, and this is something that I, I didn't know until looking into the reefs here, but if we zoom in, so there's Dry Tortuga, there's Key West. The reef, the barrier reef, actually forms at the edge of that shelf way out here um, just before it drops off in, into deep, deep ocean. And so knowing that the barrier reef forms at this sort of like 
point before the drop off, it kind of makes sense why we would have this this uh, barrier reef around Florida. <laughs> fractals, fractals, not reasoning. I have I have more faith in you. <laughs> uh, the last one then says fringing reef, barrier reef, and then an atoll. An atoll is, a, and there isn't a, a terrible picture for this one. There's actually a pretty good animation. So an atoll is a reef ring with no land present. This, uh, Charles Darwin was the one who figured out how these formed. And he realized it goes something like this. So you have an, uh, a land, some sort of land, and a fringing reef develops. And then as the land erodes, the reef continues to develop. And eventually it becomes a it goes from a fringing reef to a barrier reef, and then it becomes an atoll. So it goes through this process over time of going, uh, going between all three of those from from fringing reef to barrier reef to atoll. Let me show another picture of this. So we have the fringing at the beginning, and barrier, and then atoll. I'm a useful way to to understand how these sorts of islands, especially the really beautiful ones, uh, those beautiful atolls, that's how they form. Just long, long processes like that. Let me show a quick photo uh, as we're passing over. Oh, no, that's okay. We'll save those ones for later. That's fine. Uh, we are just passing over the salt basin now. So if I dip a wing here, this is the, the salt basin in, in general. And then the gypsum uh, sand dunes are over on the right there. We'll pass over them towards the end. Let's make ourselves a quick, uh, quick steep turn. I was training in a uh, new plane this weekend, actually. I got checked out in a Warrior II, uh, which is a kind of trainer plane, a little bit slower plane, and had to do my 45 degree steep turns, which is part of your pilot pilot's test. And so fun fact on 45 degree, I just did a 45 degree turn. Uh, I think it was pretty precise. Uh, I don't know if I would bring it to the FAA, but it's okay. All right, and now we get the, the really beautiful view of um, the Guadalupe Mountains. And you can see the Chihuahuan Desert off to the right. So if we looked, if we kept going that direction, we would hit Big Bend. Uh, and then just emerging from that desert, you can imagine why a stagecoach would be pretty excited to see this while they were in the middle of nowhere. Thank you. Oops. I uh, forgot to put away the, the picture. I guess it still shows up a little bit, but um, got a saving throw from the wife. Let me just pop out so I can actually see this old. There you go. All right, so fringing reefs, barrier reefs, and atolls. We talked about how all three of those tie together. Another type of reef to be aware of, and there are actually quite a few of other ones um, of various degrees of uh, frequency you'd see them, is, would be a platform reef. And this is, or it's called a bank reef or a table reef. And it's basically if you put, you remember that picture where the guy was putting concrete blocks down on the ground? It just provides a, a place that disrupts the flow of water and it creates, and it causes nutrients to gather there. And so... Uh, organisms like coral will start to gather there too. So you can kind of create your own reef in that way. So the reef itself has a bunch of different zones. I talked about how there's zones you can see in the park too when you go to visit. So one of them, uh, this is a picture that has sort of all three on it. And I'll talk through what each of these is. So there's the inner reef, the reef crest, and the outer reef for the four reef. Each of these different zones is a different ecosystem with different types of habitats. So these three are the, the kind of three commonly recognized, but there's a bunch of different zones you can divide it into depending on the environment. One thing to keep in mind is most coral reefs exist within 50 meters of, of water. So if you ever go scuba diving, you typically stay in the first 50 meters of, of water because that's where all the interesting stuff is. So the reef crest is the shallowest part of the reef. It's subject to surge and tides. When waves pass over shallow areas, they shoal, uh, which looks like this. And because of that, it creates agitation in the water. And then that sort of agitation is exactly where coral flourishes. So that's why it sort of gravitates towards that edge as the water shoals, then you get uh, those reefs. That's also the thousand foot high cliff of El Capitan, which we can see right there. It's that sort of view right off my left front wing. 
um, that is formed at the reef crest. So that's where that, that comes from. The four reef zone is the zone above the reef floor or the reef drop off. Uh, this zone is one of the reef's most diverse areas. Coral and calcium carbonate algae provide complex habitats and areas that offer protection, such as cracks and crevices. So this is where you might see um, various types of fish or eels or that kind of thing on that, on that four reef, the outer reef. The back reef then is a sandy, flat bottom, a sandy bottomed flat, and it may be behind the main reef containing chunks of coral. This zone may border a lagoon and serve as a protective area, or it may lie between the reef and the shore. And in, uh, in that case, it'll be a flat, rocky area. Fish tend to prefer staying in the inner reef when they can get some of the wave protection and, and nutrients. All right, there's our El Capitan view. Let me pull up a better photo of it. So this is El Capitan from a distance. It's gorgeous. This is one of the ones I, I would love to see them do a better, a better model of. Flip out. Actually, I'll go back to here. Yeah, out of reasoning. <laughs> Thirty million years. Just, just a casual couple. Uh, flying singer. It's a, it's a fun plane. That's part of the reason I got it too. It's, uh, it's, it's cheaper to fly typically. Um, it's slow, but I don't mind flying slow. It's a style choice, I guess. All right, we're taking the long way around Guadalupe Mountains here. So we talked a bit about uh, coral reefs. Let's dive into a little bit more about how they actually get created and, and the, the process by which you would um, a reef would be built. So one question that immediately occurred to me, has anyone been scuba diving before or snorkeling in coral reefs? Be curious if anyone has any, any fun stories or like things that stood out to you, things maybe you weren't expecting about them. Um, I was fortunate enough to do a scuba trip in 10th grade, so my, my 10th grade biology class did a scuba trip down to Rotan. And I remember the thing that really surprised me was when you would scuba dive between crevices, and we were on the beginner scuba routes, so we didn't do anything too, too intensive, but I remember being surprised at how textured the, the floor is. Um, and I mentioned that outer reef has a lot of crevices for fish to hide. So that's a really fun place to go scuba diving, um, but it's surprising how, how textured the whole thing is. You'd think it's sort of sort of smooth from ocean, but it's not. Wow, fractals end, odd reasoning. Coral coral would crack them. Try it out. Mad Wisman Girl, I don't I don't understand. I think it does I think it does crack when dried out or it can be cracked um, actually that's one of the ways that the inner reefs form is the coral gets cracked off by fish and then it uh, kind of becomes the the sand or the particles in the in the inner reef oh. yeah sailor guy uh the suddenly dropping uh many many meters i think it's beyond 100 meters or something you start to really encounter some problems um, and it's amazing how quickly you can you can accidentally do that All right. So, okay, how do coral reefs form? When alive, corals are colonies with small animals embedded in calcium carbonate shells. The coral heads consist of accumulations of individual animals, called polyps, arranged in diverse shapes. Polyps are usually tiny, but they can range in size from a pinhead to 12 inches across. Uh, so this is a picture of a coral polyp. It's a drawing, and they're kind of weird looking. So if you're, I don't know, if you're squeamish, I guess, well, anyway, it's a diagram of a polyp. So, um, so this is this is what an actual coral polyp looks like, and there'd be many of these around, sort of a single coral thing that you might think of. They don't photosynthesize, but they have a symbiotic relationship with. Oops, I didn't pull up the picture. There you go. There's the coral polyp. They don't photosynthesize, but they have a symbiotic relationship with microscopic algae. So that's what we talked about in the poll. These organisms live within the polyp's tissues and provide organic nutrients that nourish the polyp in the form of glucose, uh, glycerol, and amino acids. Because of this relationship, coral reefs grow much faster in clear water, which emits more sunlight. Without their symbionts, coral reef would not grow to form significant reef structures. 
Corals get up to 90% of their nutrients from their symbionts. In return, uh, as an example of mutualism, the coral shelters the algae and provides 1 million, uh, averaging 1 million for every cubic centimeter of coral. So 1 million uh, algae for every cubic centimeter of coral. And they provide a constant supply of carbon dioxide that the algae need for photosynthesis. It is also these that give the coral polyps their color. So I'll pull up a picture. There's a picture of the, of the algae. A coral that loses a, uh, a large fraction of its algae becomes white because it doesn't have that color anymore. Uh, or sometimes pastel shades, depending on the coral, um, but it's usually white. And that is called bleaching. So if you've ever heard the term bleaching or that, you know, the, the danger in the oceans would, would bleach the coral, it looks like this. So that's when they lose their, their algae counterparts. And if that happens, it can cause the uh, corals to die. Things that cause bleaching are things that cause stress on the animals. So when the coral gets stressed, such as an increase in water temperature, it, uh, it expels all of its algae, and then, uh, and then it can't survive because it doesn't have that, that food source that it needs. Uh, let me show, so reefs grow as polyps and other organisms deposit calcium carbonate in the basis of coral, which is the basis of coral, and the skeletal structure beneath and around themselves, is, I'm sorry, reefs grow as polyps and other organisms develop calcium carbonate, and that de uh, deposition forms the basis of coral. That then, as they build that skeletal structure, it pushes the coral's head upwards and outwards, and that, when you put it all together, gives you colonies that result in... Now this, this would be a polyp array. It's a bunch of them. And you can get these really fantastic structures that get built from that calcium carbonate as it gets, uh, gets added in. So here's a brain coral, other types of coral, lots and lots of different variations on this. Okay, so we are now coming at to uh, McKittrick Canyon. Pop out real quick because this is one of the one of the prettier places of the park, in my opinion. Let me do that. Playing with some of my settings. Okay, so this looks like I showed this a little earlier, but that's uh, McKittrick Canyon looks like this in, in the real world. And then we're going to be coming up in just a moment here on a view of Guadalupe Peak. And so that's what it looks like uh, in, a, in a view just a moment later. Now we're doing some canyon flying. Keep it adventurous. Okay. One of the other pieces about coral reefs is that they form some of the most productive ecosystems because they provide complex and varied marine habitats and support a wide range of other organisms. That's why they're so important to these environments is that these, these organisms depend on having that, that environment. And so we saw lots of pictures of, of coral with the fish swimming around and, and that kind of thing. Another piece of information uh, especially relevant to Everglades, the fringing reefs often uh, just below low tide level have a mutually beneficial relationship with mangrove forests. At high tide level, uh, and mangroves forests at high tide level, and seagrass meadows in between high tide and low tide. This is because the reef protects the mangroves and seagrass from strong currents and waves. And uh, while the uh, mangroves and seagrass protect the, uh, sorry, from large influxes of silt, freshwater, and pollutants. So on the one hand. Uh, the coral protects the, uh, the mangroves and the seagrass from the ocean and the waves, and then the other direction from the freshwater and from the silt, the mangroves and seagrass protect them. So a nice back and forth going on. <laughs> Fractals. <laughs> I, am, I am certain there's something in there about that, yeah. So in summary, a reef is a ridge or shoal of rock, let me quick get a little bit higher here. My uh, my spidey senses for flying up a mountain are tingling. Okay, there we go. So in summary, a reef is a ridge or shoal of rock. 
coral or similarly relatively stable material lying beneath the surface of a natural body of water. You can have biotic, abiotic, and artificial reefs, and each form in different ways. A common biotic reef is a coral reef. Coral reefs around islands often go through regular stages of development, from a fringing reef to a barrier reef to an atoll. The different parts of a reef support different types of life. Coral reefs bleach when they expel their microscopic algae friends, and this can be due to stress or other environmental issues. This can also result in the reefs dying. So with that background knowledge on reefs, I think it's time for a joke. What does a coral polyp decorate with during the holidays? What does a coral polyp decorate with during the holidays? A coral reef. All right, good stuff. Fractals, you want to post up the, uh, the next poll here? And this is a opinion poll. I removed summer so there wasn't an obvious best answer. What is the best non-summer season? I briefly while we're flying over here, on the left we have El Capitan, on the right we have Guadalupe, uh, Guadalupe Mountain, excuse me. Oh, I'm so sorry, we have Guadalupe Peak on the left and El Capitan beyond that, you can't see it. Okay, two votes for spring. So while people are voting on that, a little bit about why. So the, the second topic today is seasons. And I always try to pick topics that, when I start to research them, are surprisingly interesting. So I hope that you'll find that seasons are a little bit more interesting than, than you may expect. So connection to the park. The fall colors in the park are supposed to be incredible, especially because they have a tree called the Big Tooth Maple. So that tree looks like oops, that. So it's got this brilliant red color and, and as a leaf change. Let me pull up this video real quick. So we're heading out to the gypsum sand dunes, and what I'm going to do, I'm a little, uh, a little faster than I expected to be. So I'm going to loop around and, and get another view of the mountains, because um, the gypsum sand dunes you can kind of see them from here, but the mountains are the, are the pretty part. So again, we'll watch uh, just a couple minutes of this one, but this is the second video that I mentioned. So quick before, this is Ranger Amanda, and she's going to give an overview of uh, why leaves change color, and then also a lot of really good footage of the park. So. Bright orange leaves and colorful trees are not something you would expect to find in the Chihuahua Desert. But every year in Guadalupe Mountains National Park, our desert comes alive with fall color. Now you may be thinking, how did deciduous trees end up in the desert? During the last ice age, trees like this and many other plants and animals were able to thrive in this area with cool temperatures and significant rainfall. As the ice age ended, temperatures started to rise and rainfall amounts started to drop. Hello Chihuahua Desert! Even though there was a shift of flora and fauna in this area, our mountain range was full of small safe havens called riparian areas where the original plants and animals can still be found. Riparian areas are located near a water source and are semi-protected from the hot sun, resulting in a cooler temperature. Other than water, the thing that deciduous trees love most is sunshine. They thrive during the summer, with chlorophyll creating energy in their leaves, resulting in their beautiful green color. During the fall, as daylight hours begin to shorten, leaves stop their production of chlorophyll. The breakdown of green pigment allows other colors to be seen. The most common tree we have in the park is the Big Tooth Maple. This brings out fiery colors of yellow, orange, and red. Yellow is caused by xanthophyll, and oranges are caused by keratin, the same pigment that makes carrots orange. Reds are created by the formation of anthocyanin, the same pigment found in beets and red cabbage. Anthocyanin is formed when sugar, manufactured on sunny days, becomes trapped in the leaf during cooler temperatures. Because it is unable to circulate through the tree, the leaves change color. 
To see our amazing fall colors, the best area to explore will be Smith Springs and Devil's Hall in the Pine Springs area, McKittrick Canyon on the northeast side of the park, and Dog Canyon on the north side. The best time Cool. Thanks, Ranger Amanda. So we could talk a little bit about fall in general. She covered a bit about why leaves change and, and the different colors that they go through, which is which is cool. But I wanted to take a a, a step back and, and look at kind of a, a bigger picture with seasons. So oh, before I dive into that, it looks like we have uh, three, what, 60% uh, of the votes for the correct answer, which is spring. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it's, it's so sad for winter. Um, although I, I do get that. Okay, so just a fun, a fun little poll. So, like I said, I want to take a step back and, and talk not just about fall, but about seasons in general. So, commonly in temperate climates, much like the like much of the U.S., we talk about four seasons: so fall or autumn, winter, spring, and summer. But it turns out, um, it's better to think of seasons from an ecological perspective, ecological perspective, excuse me, as having six parts. So we typically talk about four seasons. Hopefully by the end of, of talking about seasons, you'll walk away going like, oh, maybe we should really think of them as six seasons, huh? All right, so let's talk about why we have seasons, what seasons look like in different parts of the world, and then hopefully walk away with that mental model about six seasons and what that means. So what kinds of, what kinds of seasons are we talking about? A season is a division of the year based on changes in weather, ecology, and a number of daylight and the number of daylight hours in a given region. In temperate and polar regions, the seasons are marked by changes in intensity of sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface, variations of which may cause animals to undergo hi hibernation or to migrate and plants to become dormant. So why do we have seasons? On Earth, seasons are the result of Earth's orbit around the sun and Earth's axial tilt relative to the elliptical plane. Which is a way of saying that Earth is tilted, and so as it moves around the Sun, different areas get different amounts of sunlight. So like this, right? We have a tilted Earth, and then the direct sunlight goes to different parts of that, that Earth where it hits it. I'm catching up with the comments. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mad Wisman Girl, that's true, that's true. Yeah, I don't, I don't live in a place where I have to deal much with winter anymore, so. Um, which, for those of you who have seen a couple of episodes may know that that's a, a uh, very intentional and very, uh, very much appreciated choice in, in life. Uh, okay, so again, we have the, the Earth uh, getting different angles, and when you see it all together, different seasons are just different angles of the sun relative to it. So summer, winter, spring, and autumn. Another piece of this puzzle, though, is something called seasonal lag. So some areas experience what's called seasonal lag, and this is a phenomenon where the date of the maximum average air temperature is delayed sometime after the summer solstice. That would be an example of a seasonal lag. So although the longest, hottest day of the year by direct sunlight may be at the summer solstice, the actual hottest day of the year for a region may be much later. In most of the northern hemispheres, the month of February is usually colder than the month of November despite February having significantly later sunsets and more daylight overall. Conversely, the month of August is usually hotter than the month of May, although same sort of situation. That seasonal lag is largely caused by the presence of large amounts of water. So SF is a really ex interesting example, uh, I'm sorry, San Francisco is a really interesting example of seasonal lag, as it's not seasonally symmetric. In particular, it has an exceptionally long seasonal lag in the summer with the average daily temperatures peaking in September and, the, and October being the second warmest month of the year. But it has very little seasonal lag in the winter, so its lowest temperatures are typically in December and January, which is right around the winter solstice. I'm going to do a little... let's see if I can do something like this. All right, ready? So we're going to try and do a aerobatic move. Okay, a little bit of rudder. Okay. Get that horizon and spin. How we do? Yeah, it could be better. Flying singer, have you ever done an aerobatic lesson? That's on my my list of to dos for sure. 
All right, so seasonal leg. So San Francisco has a really interesting example of seasonal leg. Seasons look a little different in different parts of the world as well. So various cultures define the number of the number and the nature of the seasons uh, based on the regional variations. And so there are a number of both modern and historic uh, ways that different cultures would talk about seasons. In temperate and subpolar regions, seasons are usually based on uh, the four that we talk about, spring, summer, autumn, or fall, and winter. Autumn or fall kind of used interchangeably. If you've never seen what that looks like over the course of a year, this is an animation of the snow throughout the year. So you can see it coming into summer here, summer in the northern hemisphere, and then the snow comes back quite a bit more. So it's much more pronounced uh, in the amount of land in the northern hemisphere, but also in the snow that, that appears. And then each season, uh, if you come from a place where we have four seasons, then you recognize these as, as the, the four common seasons. Many tropical regions, though, will talk about two seasons instead, a rainy, or wet, a rainy, wet, or monsoon season, and then a dry season. Some will also, so this is a rainy and, a, and a, wet, a wet and dry season, excuse me. Some will also talk about a third season, which is a sort of cool, mild, uh, cool or mild season, or a, a hermat, uh, hermatuan, hermatuan uh, season. So a hermatuan, which I had not heard of before, and I think I'm pronouncing it right. I practiced, but anyway, uh, is a season in West Africa that occurs between the end of November and the middle of March. Uh, it's characterized by the dry and dusty northeasterly trade winds of the same name, which blow over the Sierra Desert uh, from the Sierra Desert over Western Africa. So this is what that season looks like in that part of the world. There are many other ways to divide up seasons depending on location and criteria. So this is just a, a sampling of some of the common ones. Ooh, flying singer, fun. Yeah, glider is also something I want to do. Steerman twice and an AT6 Texan. Good choices. Okay, so we th that's a little bit about seasons in general. Now, I mentioned that uh, uh, ecologists will talk about six seasons, not four. And the reason for that, the reason why we ended up with four is that because of European colonization. So this four-season European model got spread throughout the world, and so now that's kind of how we talk about it. Ecologists, though, talk about six-season model, um, and the, the temperate climate regions is not fixed to a particular calendar date. So it's not like the first season starts at a particular date. Instead, it starts based on where you are um, and when certain plants start to develop certain, or certain things start to occur in the environment. So these six different seasons are uh, pre-vernal, vernal, estivial, uh, serotonal, autumnal, and hibernal. I'll talk about each of those in a little bit more, so, so if you missed it, don't worry. We'll, we'll come back to it. So like I said, they, they choose these things based on certain types of floral and animal events. So flowers bloom in the spring or hedgehogs hibernate in the winter, right? And so you can observe these changes, and then unlike calendar-based months, you can tell what season your particular region is moving through. So maybe you're further north in the United States or further south in the United States. You'd see these seasons occur in different, different times. All right, so let me pull this up real quick. And I'm going to do quick before I run into the mountains here. Oops. OK, let me just correct this plane. There we go. All right, so I'm going to pull up a picture and talk through all six of them very briefly. Thank you, fractals. So we have uh, from the bottom, this is pre-vernal, which is uh, begins in early February, and it's kind of a uh, sort of February to March, and it's when deciduous tree buds begin to swell. And uh, I'm sorry. Yes, this one. And some types of migrating birds fly from winter to summer habitats. Vernal, then, is when tree buds burst into leaves. Uh, est uh, estival begins in June, and this is when trees are in full leaf and birds hatch and raise offspring. Serotonal would be kind of mid to late August, and this is when leaves start to change color in higher latitudes. Young birds reach maturity and join older birds preparing for autumn migration. This is also kind of the traditional seasonal harvest in early September. Autumnal would be autumn, generally mid to late spring, and this is when the leaves turn fully brown. 
and then hibernal would be when deciduous trees are bare and the fallen leaves begin to decay. So they sort of have it as leaves still falling, but but it's sort of that that uh, hibernal when when migrating birds are settled in their winter habitats and animals might be hibernating. So there's your six seasons to walk away from, and and keep an eye out for these over the next year because as I'm thinking back through um, seeing these seasons change, it's it's a lot clearer and you start to notice the things that happen together so like oh the the leaves are starting to bud at the same time that certain animals are appearing and then as soon as everything shifts it moves to a new season as a unit Um, maybe you see it in the trees first but you'll notice it in the animals too so to summarize a season is a subdivision of the year based on changes in weather ecology and number of daylight hours in a given region in temperate and subpolar regions these are often divided into four seasons Many other parts of the world use two or three seasons, a wet and a dry season, typically. From an ecological perspective, ecological perspective, though, we can think of six seasons that occur at different times of the year, depending on the location. So knowing that besides the ecological reasons, the seasons are sort of just made up, I'm thinking that I can introduce my own new seasons, right? So first, let's start easy. We know that we have a season where it's mostly sunny, warm, and dry. We'll call that ice cream season. And we probably want a season for when flowers start to appear. It's a good season. And we'll call that flower season, because we have ice cream season and flower season. So far, so good. Something's missing from that, though. So ice cream and flower, we do probably need some sort of cold season. Uh, So let's say this season starts whenever the average temperatures drop below, let's say, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Cold, right? 65 degrees. And we'll call this one the coldest week of the year. (laughs) Okay, perfect. So we have ice cream, ice cream season, we have flower season, and we have unreasonably mild winters, which sounds like exactly my kind of seasons. All right, we'll finish there then. Uh, Fractals, can you post up the poll for where we want to go next week? <laughs> yeah, the Midwest, I feel like it's uh it's mostly winter, right? <laughs> Fall, spring, and second winter, yeah. Uh I feel like there's a Lord of the Rings joke in there somewhere. So alright, so a couple options. Lake Clark, Joshua Tree, and Kings Canyon National Parks. So today we talked about we visited Guadalupe Mountains National Park. We talked a little bit about uh reefs, we talked about seasons, and we talked about Wallace Pratt. Uh, Fractals posted up that survey. Uh, I'd love your input on the show. Anything you'd like to see changed or improved, always welcome feedback. Also love if you'd like to come hang out in the Discord community. Uh, We chat about the national parks and other things that are going on. And we'll give people just a second here to vote. See where we want to go. It seems like we have a a leader emerging. Yeah, uh, M. Rosno, I I spent a lot of time in in the Midwest, and I I do remember this... um, this what false spring second winter sort of shenanigans uh, it's not not my cup of tea but i do like that interpretation oh <laughs> nice fractals i didn't know that yeah it's in uh, california king canyon is, is a california national park it's right near sequoia national park actually so one of the other things that i didn't expect to learn as much about is how the national park divides up management. So dry tortugas and Everglades are managed together and then Sequoia and Kings Canyon are managed together. So we'll do them as separate parks, but they're the same, of the same, same general management. All right. I think that's uh, probably good to call the, the poll on this one. So next week we will head to Joshua tree national park in Southern California. With that, Thank you all for being my co-pilot today. And until we meet again, stay curious and keep on exploring. See you all next week.